We'll go right to our phone callers. Talk to Warren in Fort Worth, Texas. Hi, Warren. Hi, hey, thank you for your ministry. I really enjoy it. I try to listen to it every day. About a month ago, I was listening to a man, and I thought he was trying to speak to you on the doctrine of rapture. Do you believe in the rapture? Well, I don't believe in a pre-tribulational rapture, which is very popular in modern Christianity, because I don't see any biblical warrant for it. And so, no matter how popular something becomes, we should always test it in light of Scripture and hold fast to the good. And nowhere in Scripture do we find either verses or collections of passages that teach us that there is such a thing as a pre-tribulational rapture. In fact, this is a 19th century idea. The fact that it's modern and new doesn't mean it's not true, but it does mean we should examine it carefully. It's a 19th century idea that actually came out of the notion that God has two distinct people with two distinct plans for those two distinct people, necessitating two distinct phases of the second coming, a secret coming followed seven years later by a second coming after which they say people are saved. I don't find any biblical warrant for this, and the very passages that are pointed to, like John chapter 14 or 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, do not make the point at all. In fact, you have to take the point and impose it on the passage as opposed to extracting it from the passage. What about the pictures of the rapture as uh, the angels coming and taking a lot out of Sodom or the picture of the aid in the ark saving them from destruction? Yeah, well, that's not a picture of rapture. In fact, it pictures the exact inverse of rapture. What it pictures is judgment. To take the second example that you gave, which is given by our Lord in Matthew chapter 24, think about what the text actually tells us. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. Now, the first question we ask is, who was taken away? In the text by way of context, we recognize that it was those who were left and taken in judgment, not those who entered the ark. So, so this passage in no way points to a pre-tribulational rapture. Not only so, but the entire context of the Olivet Discourse points to Christ coming in judgment on Jerusalem and on the temple. So this is not about the second appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is about the coming of Christ in judgment. Do you believe the church is the angels that are coming back with Christ when he comes to judge the world? Well, remember that what Jesus said ought to be the template by which we judge all things, and we should take the clear and use that as the paradigm by which we test that which is cloudy. And what did Jesus Christ say? Do not be amazed at this. A time is coming when all who are in the graves will come out. Some will rise to live and some will rise to be eternally condemned. Nothing in Scripture points to the notion that Christ is going to come down, reverse directions, take people up to heaven for seven years while two-thirds of all Jews on earth are going to die in a bloody massacre. That's something imposed on the biblical text, not something extracted from the biblical text. And passages like 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, if you read them in context, they are about the great and glorious hope of resurrection. That's why Paul says, we do not grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Let me say, moreover, that God does not have two distinct people. He has always only had one chosen people, and that one chosen people on both sides of the cross are made up of those who are the followers of Yahweh, the God of Israel, revealed in Jesus Christ. And this is not a function of genealogy or ethnicity. It's always a function of relationship, never a function of race. That's why we find Rahab, a Canaanite, in the lineage of Jesus Christ. 
It's why we find Ruth a Moabite in the lineage of Jesus Christ. It's why in Esther, as the nations look on and see Esther sovereignly raised up to save the Jews from certain destruction under Haman, The text tells us on that day, many people from many different nations became Jews. How did they do that? They couldn't change their birth mother. What they did was they gave themselves over to Yahweh, the God of Israel, and as a result of that, were brought into all the types and shadows that ultimately point forward to Jesus Christ. So God is not a racist. People from every language and nation and people that revere him are the chosen of God. And that is true on both sides of the cross. Okay. I read a book by Tim LaHaye, the greatest book on rapture, something like that. Uh, what I read, he was showing where the belief in rapture went all the way back to 300 A.D. Well, what he's saying is, with all due respect, absolutely 100% false. That is not true, and it is a shame on his part that he communicates what he knows is not true. I can't judge his motivation for doing that, but it is quite frankly a shame. I have actually delineated this in terms of the genesis of this idea in my book, The Apocalypse Code, and also I have clearly and cogently pointed out why the notion that this goes back to pseudo-Ephraim in the third or fourth century is a false presupposition and has no basis whatsoever in reality or fact. But I've written about this subject. If you want to read about this in short form, There's an entry in afterlife. Will Christians be in heaven during a seven-year tribulation on earth? So I deal with the pre-tribulational rapture theory. I also deal with it in more detail in my book, The Apocalypse Code, find what the Bible really says about the end times and why it matters today. You can find the answers to your question in both those resources. But my contention is this. We need to take all things and test theories, no matter how popular they have become in light of Scripture and hold fast to the good.